Well, welcome to Chase Oaks. My name is Katie Bailey. I am the youth pastor over at our Sloan Creek campus, and I am so excited to be with you today as we talk about anxiety. Um, But before we get into that, I am pretty confident that there are two types of people in the room with us today. And uh, one group of people is really bummed that they're not going to get to hear the Spice Girls clip at church anymore. Um, It's super nostalgic for you. I had many a roller skating rink birthday parties with that blaring. And uh, so it takes me back a little bit. I'm going to be a little sad. And then there are others of you in the room who you've come to peace with that. Um, If you never hear that Spice Girls clip again, you're going to be okay. Um, But I mean, I like it. I enjoyed the Spice Girls when I was younger. And so I will ask my youth sometimes, I'm like, hey, do you even do you even know who they are? And and then they remind me that I'm old and it's great. Um, But I actually, despite them reminding me that I am old, uh, I really do love youth. Um, I think they're wonderful. And I think a lot of times they get kind of a bad reputation. Like sometimes when people think of teenagers, they think of like reckless, rebellious, maybe even rude, just like thrill seeking maniacs. Right. And, And that is true of some of them. Yes. But more and more, as a demographic of people, um, I'm finding teens to really value safety. And actually, they're they're anxious, like clinically, chronically anxious. I I was talking to one of my teens the other day about her mental health, and uh, I gave her some unsolicited advice because teenagers love that. And I'm like, all right, you know what would help your anxiety? Like, seriously, if you slept and drink water like I'm not saying it would cure it but if you just slept and drink water I think that that would do you a world of good and of course she doesn't listen to me she's still surviving on a few hours of sleep at night and iced coffee I don't know how Um, (laughs) and I do believe that sleep and water is great for you but let's be honest like that's not going to cure anybody's anxiety right Anxiety and mental health are tremendously complicated. Um, Because you have a body, a physical body, I believe that doctors and medication might be helpful and even necessary when it comes to anxiety. And because you have a brain and a mind, um, therapy and counseling might be necessary and helpful when it comes to dealing with anxiety. Um, But I'm not a mental health professional, and I'm not a medical professional. I'm a pastor, and I'm here today because you also have a soul. And if we approach our mental health and anxiety from only the physical body aspect or from the emotional care and counseling aspect, we're just missing a huge part of ourselves. And so I want to talk about today the relationship that our faith can have on anxiety, okay? I have a really narrow lane to run in. So I want to start with a verse in 1 Peter. It says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. And this, this is a little odd, right? Like, it makes it sound like there's a direct correlation between humility and the way that we give our cares over to Jesus or our ability to cast our cares over to Jesus. And here's what I think one of the issues is as we wrestle with anxiety is that it's super accessible. All right. The Bible uses worry and anxiety kind of interchangeably, and I'm going to do so as well today. Um, But the truth is that we all have some level of worry or anxiety in our lives because it's really easy. All that it takes To experience anxiety is something that you care about, that you are also not fully in control over, right? So so say you have a job and you like having a job, but you aren't in control over your boss or your coworkers or your employees or the economy or the deal or like whatever it is, right? But you still care and you're not in complete control. And so there's room for anxiety to slip in or your health. You have influence over your health, right? You can exercise and eat salad or whatever, but you can't prevent every disease or sickness. You you can't see what's coming around the corner. And so because of that, 
there's room for anxiety or our relationships with other people. Like we care about what other people think of us and we have influence over that. Like you can smile and be polite and wear deodorant and all those good things, but you don't control other people. You can't control how they think of you or what they think of you. And so because we have all these things that we care about that we're not in control over, we end up holding a lot of worries and anxiety. And yet scripture tells us to cast our anxieties onto God because he cares for us. And here's what I think is going on here. Has anybody ever been told you're enough? Like maybe it's just a chick thing. I don't know. I'm seeing this everywhere, right? And it's in this context of like, go get it. Like, mama, you're enough. You've got this, right? And when somebody tells me that, um, I think they're trying to encourage me. I think they're being kind, and they're trying to communicate that they believe in me, right? And, and I, so I try to take it for what it's worth, right? They're being nice. But I can't think of a single situation in my life where I am actually, literally enough. I have three kids. There's three of them. And when I am present and focused and, and paying attention to one of those children... It's because the other two don't have my attention. When I'm at home just rocking it as a mother and a wife, it's because I'm not at work and vice versa. There's actually no situation in my life where I'm completely competent. And you know what? That actually affords me a lot of peace. And here's why. Because as long as my expectation for myself is enoughness, then the weight of the world is falling on my shoulders. But when I'm willing to raise my hand and say, like, you know what, I'm not enough, and I am broken, and I am limited, and I can't handle it all, then all of a sudden I'm forced to look outside of myself for help bearing the load of life, and I have the freedom to set boundaries. And so it's, to me... It reminds me um, a little bit of my kids. My, my children, they love watching my husband work out. We live really close to our gym, and they like to go and they watch, like, the last 10 minutes of his workout. And they just, they think their dad is the best. Like, if you were to ask my 7-year-old son who is the strongest, he would probably tell you, like, God, because he's the church kid. And then right under God is Batman, and then, like, a close third under Batman is Daddy, Right? And so, okay, guys, um, this child, he is seven. He walked up to my daughter's karate instructor. This guy's like a triple black belt, okay? He's competed in the Olympics. And my son walks up to him, and he's like, my dad's stronger than you. <laughs> Dude, you can't do that. You're going to get his beat up. Um, he just, he loves watching Matt work out. Uh, and every time, whenever Matt is finished, my kids will all three, they'll walk up to my husband's weights and they'll try to move them around the way that my husband does as if they're only just a little bit less strong than he is. We always have to tell him like, like back up. It's like 400 times your body weight. Like, what are you thinking? Of course you can't take that on. But listen, imagine if we let him try. Like, can you imagine if we took my husband's weight and we put it on my seven-year-old son's shoulders? Do you understand that would break him, right? But here's the thing. I think anxiety is doing the same thing to us. It's us taking the burdens of the world, the things that we don't have control over, and it's us carrying it on our shoulders. And I think anxiety is like cruelly standing beside you and saying like, yeah, pick it up, carry it around. You're strong enough for it. Keep worrying about it. You've almost come to a solution. And I think part of the humility that the scripture is talking about here is the ability to cast off that weight. It's the idea of like literally throwing something off of your shoulders because it's too much for you and raising your hand and saying, I'm not enough for this, but I know somebody who is. And so friends, what if the next time you and I are wrestling with anxiety, we simply took that as our invitation to pause and to look to the one who is enough 
And so for me, the past several weeks, it's been like, God, I'm not enough for my kid's future. I can't handle it. I'm not in control of it. I have no authority over it. But Jesus, you do, and you love me, and you love them. So will you be enough in this space? Or Jesus, I have access through my phone to every single tragedy on the planet. And they keep coming, one after another. And and I don't heal from one before the next one comes. And I'm not enough to heal any of it. But Jesus, you are. And so give me the wisdom to understand where I'm supposed to act and what my responsibility is and what is simply not mine to carry. I had a friend who was talking about her anxiety the other day, and she's like, I feel like all of my worries are like a bunch of bricks that I carry around, and I'm at the bottom of a swimming pool. And I don't understand why I can't let these things go. And it's my assumption that as long as we are carrying our anxieties and our worries, it's giving us the feeling that we're in control or that we're somehow preparing for something. And we're told to cast our cares on Jesus because he loves us. Jesus, in his famous Sermon on the Mount, he asks what I assume is a rhetorical question. He says, can any of you by worrying add a single day to your life, a single hour to your life? He says in that Matthew verse, he says, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying at a single hour to your life, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness? And these things will be given to you as well, so do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus in this, he's asking us to reprioritize, right? He's not saying, like, quit your job and go lie in a field, right? But he's saying, what I want you to do is I want you to focus on me first, focus on the kingdom of God first, understand what I am calling you to, and then all of these day-to-day worries, like, those are going to work themselves out, right? And so what if the next time you and I are wrestling with worry and anxiety, we ask ourselves this simple question, and that's, is this mine to carry? Is this mine to carry? I have um, up here a circle of influence, and all this is, is it's things that are actually within our control, right? And it's a really short list, and it is how I treat people, my attitude, my actions, and my words. Like, that's it. That's really what we are in control over. But all too often when we are worrying and wrestling with anxiety, it is almost like we are begging God for the driver's seat. Please let me be in charge of this. Let me be God over the life of my kids. Or please just let me be God over my job or my marriage or my household. Whatever it is. Like just let me be God for just a minute because I think I could make it turn out better than you will. But instead Jesus has told us what's ours, right? Jesus has told me as a mother to love my children. That's mine to carry. Um, But their future isn't. I can't control it. I'm not big enough for it. I'm, I'm simply not enough for it. Jesus has been incredibly clear on how we are to treat other people. We are to treat others with kindness and respect and dignity and generosity. But when I am lying awake at night, reliving the dumb thing that I said, I have to ask, like, okay, like, did I do something wrong Do I owe somebody an apology? Do I need to restore a relationship? Or do I just really, really want to be adored? Because one of those things is within my circle of influence. I can control it. Jesus has told me to. And the other thing is God's. And I can't take that on my shoulders. 
I'm not enough for it. There's this one last story I want to share with you. Jesus is traveling and he's invited into the house of two women. Um, Luke 10 says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened up her home to him. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. And she came and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Now, listen, y'all, this story is powerful. Like this story has power to cause fights on the way home. Do you understand what I am saying? Y'all tread lightly, okay? But listen, we've all been in a situation like that. Like there's something at stake and there's a lot to be done and you're working very, very hard and you look up and somebody else isn't pulling their weight and there's like a panic in those situations, right? I feel like Martha's question is valid because what she's saying is she's like, Jesus, do you see me? Do you see the, the burden that is on my shoulders right now? Do you feel the pressure and the weight of expectation? Send help. Tell my sister to help me. And then Jesus responds. He says, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things. But few things are needed. Or indeed only one. And Mary has chosen what is better. And it will not be taken from her. And listen... I read this and I think to myself, like, Jesus, are you not hungry? No, seriously. Because it sounds like if, if Martha doesn't make dinner, you aren't eating. Like, I imagine one of the disciples in the background, like, raising his hand and being like, well, I'm, I'm okay if she makes dinner. <laughs> like, be okay with me. But here's what I think Jesus is saying. I think he's saying, like, Martha, I don't need another servant who doesn't know me. I want a disciple. Like Martha, I don't think you understand how loved you are in this situation. Martha, I didn't come over here for dinner. I came here to spend time with you. And Martha, like, yes, I see your burdens and your stress and your anxiety. I see everything that you're carrying. But listen, unless you sit at my feet and let me minister to you, I can't help you with that burden. Friends, isn't it amazing that Jesus is more concerned with Martha's spiritual well-being, with her peace, than he is with what she accomplishes for him? Do you think that maybe, just maybe, Jesus isn't looking over our shoulder with a spreadsheet of last year's numbers, but instead he is inviting us into a relationship where he can minister to us so we can soak in his goodness and his rest and his peace and his life so that when we go out and minister into a lost and dark and broken world, we are doing so out of an abundance of life that we can't get anywhere else but at the feet of our Savior. Maybe, just maybe, true peace, like not just the absence of conflict, but actual peace comes when we spend time with Jesus. And maybe I've just been too distracted to enjoy it. I've been asking myself a lot um, over this series, like what I would do if Jesus asked me the same thing that he asked blind Bartimaeus. It's what the series has been based off of. Jesus walks up to a blind beggar and he says like, hey, what would you like me to do for you? And so I've thought about it. Like, what would I do if I came home today and like Jesus is sitting on my couch petting my dog? And he said, like, Katie, like, what, what would you like me to do for you? And, man, I got a list. I have a list of things that my heart aches for. 
But I think I'd start with my kids. Like, Jesus, I really, really just want my kids to be okay. I want our home to be a safe place for them. I want conflict to stop. I want world poverty to go away. I want justice. And I imagine Jesus listening patiently to me until I exhaust my list. And I imagine I'm saying, like, yeah, I want, I want those things too. And in fact, I've promised those things. Jesus has promised he will come back and make all wrongs right. And so in the meantime, until that day, until his return, you and I can have his peace. And so the question is, will we invite Jesus to be enough for us? We're going to transition into a time of communion. Um, You should have gotten a little cup on the way in. If you didn't grab one, now is a great time to go. Uh, Because here, in part, is what communion does for us, is it reminds us that Jesus has already filled in the gap. You and I, we can't fight or achieve Or grow our way into heaven. And so Jesus in his enoughness. In his fullness. He stepped into that gap. And he accomplished what only he could. So that you and I have the opportunity to have a relationship with God. And so at your campuses. Your host is going to lead communion. I'm going to go ahead and pray for us. And for communion. And then we'll take it together. Jesus, thank you for your enoughness. God, when I'm overwhelmed, remind me that you are plenty strong. And you are in control. And you are good. And that you love us dearly. That you love us dearly as a church. And God, you also love me personally. Help me to look to you because I can't do this on my own. It's in your holy name that we pray. Amen.